You never know what's going to get said while we're waiting for the 27 to turn into 50. I Jeff, know. What I was curious about in your email, like I looked at that um, doc, were you referring to their um, post-incident, the PIR, like executive summary? Uh, um, they admitted some? Yeah, I mean, I've read the whole document. Yeah. So, you know, but yes, that is certainly, you know, uh, worthwhile came out yesterday um, after our conversation, Andrew, that we had just sort of bouncing ideas around. So I thought it was interesting. You know, we can definitely get into it. Did they, did they uh, directly say that um, or more just indirectly say it was a lack of QA? Uh, no, they've come out and directly said that. I mean, they didn't use those terms, but they definitely came out and directly said that. You know, I was trying to see where where that was, you know, per se, where, where, where they were saying that. But, yeah, it's in the summary. I mean, you obviously you have to read between between the lines. There's a little bit of um, inside baseball speak, but yeah. it's, it's pretty clear. I mean, I don't know if you want to cover this now or wait till we really get going, but it's it's they're making a clear admission that their processes of um, error checking this the particular type of file, update file that they shut out were not adequate. And really? they're going to be changing those processes. Yeah. That Which may you, save the company. Who knows? What's that, Andy? I said that may save the company. Who knows? What's going to be interesting, you know, what we're doing uh, as a follow-up, we'll give it one more minute and then get going, ship here on, on seat, you know, get more people in. But um, what's interesting is we're doing a, I thought, timely. So we, we obviously, <laughs> we started, you know, a few weeks ago with, CDK, then we went into, you know, business impact analysis, then we went into obviously CrowdStrike and, you know, crisis communication and dealing with, you know, preparation for incidents that are unforeseen of this scale. So so now let's just say it, we're, this coming week, I think it's gonna be really, really interesting. We're having um, read on from fifth wall. Because um, not surprising, this is not a cyber insurance claim. So if you're an MSP, right, Jim, and you're big, let's just say you're a decent sized MSP, you not only have direct costs, but you have, you know, indirect law. You know, I, I spent 200 man hours remediating, getting customers back up in line. Yep. I lost 200 hours over here, X amount were project and onboarding. So I'm making up a number, I, in the video, I make up a number of 50,000 bucks. You know, it's what we're going to talk about is it's techie and O, and the check isn't just going to show up in the mail. <laughs> Surprise, right? So, yeah. How do you go, you know, and, and, you know, get compensated for this? And it's going to be a really an interesting cyber call uh, talking through this um, whole process. So, anyway. All right, um, so let's kick it off. I'll share my screen here and Jim's back. Good, Jim, because you're up first with yep. wins of the week. And do you have any good wins, Jim, you want to share as we ask uh, everybody on the call there if they've got any good wins they want to share? Yeah, I was, uh, well, everyone's thinking about their wins of the week. I'll share one. I was on a call yesterday where I found out that one of our larger MSPs, uh, they're probably top 12. Um, they decided they were going to do the coverage extension notification template that we have. Uh, you want to give a guess, Andrew, how much monthly recurring revenue they added? How many endpoints? I can't give you that number. Oh, that's you cheating, to... Andrew. Yeah, I know. We all know you can do arithmetic. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well... <laughs> Well, I mean, it, rather large. I don't know. Let, if, how much is that? We talking MRR, ARR? What do you want? And let's do MRR. MRR. Um, I'm going to say a rather large MSP. I'm going to go with, I don't know, if they're the top 12, they've got 40,000 endpoints. Uh, they added another 30,000 a month in MRR. Higher. $85,000 in. Monthly recurring revenue has been added. Wow. Yep. 
Wow, How much is problem. that enterprise value? Yeah, exactly. So enterprise value. So you figure that's uh, essentially a million bucks of error, right? And you, then you got to do the math on what the what the EBITDA is on that. But obviously the margins are great. And you know they just added like worst case scenario. They've added based on their multiples about $7 million of enterprise value. Jim, do you yeah, have- Smith, I heard it was 18 million by the way. Jim, what's that, Andrew? You got a VIG on that? Oh God. I wish Andrew, I you did. were literally reading my mind. <laughs> And I was I was going to joke, and now we're announcing that Sazlers will be uh, requesting a royalty payment on enterprise value ads of all partners. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't I don't see why you know it, it you know there's an issue there, Jim. Yeah. Um, Look, it, yeah. it's obviously great. You know, we, we we a part of our mission from day one, and this was this was actually Jim's tagline: protect and monetize. Mm -hmm. Want to help this this community make money? Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. It is. And, you know, obviously I would love a big and all the ones that we you know, help do that. But the reality is I'm ecstatic that an MSP has been able to do that with us. Now we've got, I mean, countless that have obviously not to that extent, although we do have some that have done a little bit more because they're even bigger than them. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, eighty five thousand dollars of of monthly recurring revenue is is pretty phenomenal, and they it's going to help them. You know, basically hit their their numbers for the year. They're private equity backed, and uh, it's they're catching stuff left and right for their customers. So it's just it's a big win, I think, all the way around. All right. Oh, now. another important number in that the opt out yeah. rate was was. Again, less than five percent. Wow, that's that's awesome. So, for those of you out there that are always thinking to yourselves, "My customers will never go for that," <clears throat> we now have a lot of proof, a lot of data points indicating that they do go for that. We've got <clears throat> somewhere between we've read around eighty or so MSPs that have all done this, and on average, the opt-out rate is slightly less than five percent. Jim, was the um was the effort strictly an email or is it a combined convert, you know, VCIO conversation, follow-up? Like, do, do you know any of the details? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah. It's on, on. yeah. I mean, we we did a couple of you know sessions with their sales and marketing leaders. They took our template, yep. they emailed it out. Okay. And it was, you know, they got pushed back from probably about 20 customers. Okay. And then they had individual conversations with those. Most of them after, you know, having the conversation, they were okay. Um, handful decided they weren't going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's basically how it went. Yeah, you know, they, they put together, they used our Microsoft Security Plus plan, which everyone here has access to. Um, they put their logo on it. They use our template to send it out. And uh, they gave everyone basically a free month. And now they're billing for it. Well, look, look Jim, if they're using your logo and template, there's definitely some big there that you got to get. No, they're not losing. They're not using our logo. They're using their logo. <laughs> I'm just getting around. Your logo, yeah. saying your, your template. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Andy, what do you got? I was just going to say, Jim, it sounds like they didn't do the two-week analysis. They just gave them the month and, and started doing full-blown support for it and yeah. then started to charge. So that's actually a very helpful piece that helps reduce costs, potentially. Yeah, exactly, Andy. So they just took the, the you know notion of, we're going to give it to you for a month. You have it now unless you opt out. And then we're going to start charging you know in July. So, but Andrew, I'll be interested to see if anyone else has any wins of the week. I do too. And it's got to be larger than 85,000 to qualify, just so you know. 
Well, no. it can it can be a straight up security win. Um, and, yes, of and course. I'll, I'll chime sure. in here. So Ben oh. and I were on a call with a partner today, relatively small partner. Um, but he described that this week, kind of the classic scenario that Enrique painted for us a couple of weeks ago, partner with uh, internal IT, two internal oh. IT guys. Um, so enough staff to support that. We didn't really get into the exact number of accounts they manage. Um, they've been trying like hell to push these guys to M for MFA. The internal IT guys aren't even on board with it. Um, they have a combination of messy things out there, including expired accounts that have been hanging around for years. Um, and the president of the company um, had was compromised, triggered a respond rule, caught it, got him remediated. And he's obviously hoping to use that to move forward and impress upon uh, this team the uh, the importance of basic security hygiene. So um, I know it's a repeating story that we hear often, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, and I wish I checked to see if he was on the call and he's not. I, it, it's worth repeating that we're all fighting the battle. Um, and, you know, you're not alone if you're dealing with these same kinds of customers. It just seems like they're out there all over the place. And we're, we're doing what we can to help them, but they got to they got to drink the water once we put the bowl in front of them. Yeah, absolutely. I hear Enrique, guy. Uh, I I was describing a scenario, Enrique, that was very similar to the one that you had a couple weeks ago. With. Oh, okay, just wanted, I came in late, wanted to make sure I wasn't missing anything. No, we were talking about you before that, though. But you know, that's a different story. <laughs> you know, I, I I am curious. I know Corey's on. Look, he might be hard at work here. There you are, Corey. Hey, um, Corey, I'm curious. Like with the services you guys offer, have there been considerations for red team you know type engagements and like you know to to exploit you know like kind of like Bo Bullock does breaching m365 and you know and and being you know using the red side to set up hey look this is how we were able to compromise your m365 this way this way this way um has that ever been a consideration on the services side of solutions granted now obviously you know, Sonicwall or considered? Considered, yes. Uh, potentially partnered conversations, yes. But I, I got I to gotta believe that, like, that, that would be a fairly uh, interesting way to drive revenue in that area. You know, but you, you get it both sides. Yeah, but I mean, the key thing is, is using your, your skill set and looking at the maturity of where you're currently at in your, your offerings, right? So, you know, our, our main drive is the defense behind it, right. All right, being the defenders and the first responders. Um, you know, we have had conversations with other organizations that all they do is red teaming. And so something like that, you know, initially is a, uh, a collaboration effort more than just bringing it on and just doing it yourself. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, fair. We do our own internal red teaming, um, but as far as having it as an offering, it's just it's not okay. the model of what we're doing at the moment. Got it. Leron, could you have that added um, to the autonomous pen testing uh, module by next week? Yeah, it'll be done in 15 minutes, Andrew. Okay, awesome. All right, what other wins do we got uh, out there? Anyone else have an interesting scenario? It's got to be one more. I saw, I saw Zach uh, put out the... When I talked last week about the phishing campaign, I'm curious if anybody had any wins off of that, if there's any detections for anybody else, because we're still, we're seeing it die down. So I think the campaign's starting to wrap up until the next one, <laughs> but curious if anybody saw any activity or implemented the response rule. Doesn't look like it. Sounds like you're ahead of the curve, Corey. I like and it. Corey, I took the rule and I've made it a template and it's, it's it'll be published as a public template shortly. Gotcha. Corey, speaking of phishing, uh, have you seen any um, fun CrowdStrike domains or phishing come your way yet? Or... No. No. Uh, and I, I, I'm always willing to give my input once you get to that section around the CrowdStrike incident. I look okay. at it from a different perspective as well. Yeah, I think we're going to start there. We, we, yeah, we will get there. Absolutely. All right. Miss Amy, I'll uh, stop sharing for you and then we'll move on to Ben and Amanda. All right. Well, I also have stuff to share for Ben and Amanda. So I'm going to be doing some sharing for a few minutes. Right. Um, let's 
switch over to this desktop. Okay, so first, uh, in your inbox yesterday, you should have received our July newsletter. So just some recaps from the month. We have our best practices for documentation and password protection webinar that we did. You can access the recording here. Um, you can check out our new blog article around Microsoft 365 security. Leave us a channel program review if you have not done so previously, uh, and you will get a $15 gift card. Uh, ConnectWise users are encouraged to register for Catapult event out of Atlanta. Um, SAS alerts will be there with our friends Decision Digital. Um, reminder about the Channel Days program. If you did not register to win last week, uh, do so. I'll share the link in the chat. Uh, there's still time to register to win. I think our SAS alerts prize gets given away tomorrow. Um, as always, platform enhancements, I'm not going to go through all of these, but the team's been hard at work. As always, we have our partner quote of the month. Thank you, Harrison, who I don't think I saw on the call saying that SaaS Alerts is the king of kings of SaaS apps. And then our partner of the month, Tech Wolf, who I also don't think is on the call, Damon, um, talked about a threat that he helped thwart off for a prospect um, and he's very grateful and we loved his story and we wanted to give him kudos for sharing it. Um, so in your inbox, keep an eye out for it, um, last Wednesday of the month. Um, but I will share this link. Let me know if you want to see anything else from here. And with that, I will pop over to this tab. Can you see risky inbox rules now? Yes. Okay. Um, and I will kick it over to Ben and Amanda. Yeah. Hey everyone. So Ben and I are going to tag team this one a little bit today. We have some, a new feature coming for respond rules specifically around, um, the filter operators, like with all of our other features, you know, we try to release something out there and see how you guys are using it and take in the feedback that's provided to us. Many people have asked for there to be flexibility in those operators and what you the search fields are they're using so we will be launching a new operator that tentatively is called matches you know wait until we actually release it and we'll see if we'll, we still call it matches but right now we're calling it matches and it's going to allow some flexibility when you're searching for criteria specifically in the description details when you're looking for things like file names and stuff like that. So Ben's going to walk us through, though, how powerful this can be in an example of a rule that you can use once this is available. Yeah. So um, if you guys aren't using this risky inbox rule, uh, definitely look into it. Even as it sits right now, it's still very powerful. Uh, about six months ago, you know, we I started like keeping an eye on some of the stuff that was in the database as far as like rule creation. And there was, it started out a little bit low. Occasionally you'd see one created with a period, two periods, but over time it's gotten progressively worse. And the threat actors know that we are looking for this sort of activity. So they said, well, hey, he's never gonna catch us if we use a bunch of dashes or maybe some, uh, you know, maybe 16 periods or something. Uh, but that's kind of where the inflexibility of our current system was, you know, it had to be very specific. So if you go to the next slide for me, Amy. This was close to what you had to create in order to get the one with up to three periods, but that didn't include four or five, six or seven. So you can kind of see where this would be getting a little out of hand and it got kind of lengthy. Uh, there's a couple of our bigger partners that uh, have many, many, many <laughs> description details. Uh, so I wanted us to, uh, <laughs> so I wanted us to be able to, <laughs> I want us to be able to um, add some flexibility um, so that if they are using one, we don't have to be so specific about, you know, the rule that they're going to be creating. Uh, we can be uh, very, very lenient. And so if you go to the next slide, what we are, we want the system to be uh, end up being is something similar to this. I mean, if they create a inbox rule, maybe just starting with a period and anything after that, we're going to trigger off of. And that's where the, the, the asterisk comes in. Most of you will recognize that as, as what it is, a wild card. Um, and this is also something that's gonna be very valuable for not only inbox rule creation, but you can probably use your imagination and other things that we can use this wild card for as well. 
Um, so in this instance, we're looking for a uh, kind of specific text inbox email rule created uh, with starts with a period, but anything after that, and then has been created, we're going to trigger off of. So your rules should be much shorter um, when it comes to description details. And I've seen firsthand some of the rules that threat actors are creating, uh, and this has been very, very effective. Awesome questions. That's fantastic. There was comments on regex and things like that in the chat. Ben, you want to address some of that, if you will? And is this available now? It's not available now. It will be coming shortly. We'll let you guys know when we fully release it, but we wanted to give you guys the preview that it is coming. Um, it yep. does not support the regex. It does support the wildcard, as Ben has explained right now. I had a question but, about if, what if the wildcard character becomes part of that description detail? How can we do an asterisk, for example? It's a good question. Uh, I would like think double, uh, double double asterisk, and that way you know it's a wild, asterisk wildcard. Andy, there's probably a way to escape it. It's a good question. We'll definitely look into mm -hmm. it. Thank you. But uh, luckily, most of this, the symbols that have been created uh, do start with periods, dashes, stuff like that. Uh, most of them, honestly, if you just use this rule as it is with just the one period, you're most likely going to catch some some sort of activity. Um, but this will make it much more flexible. Great stuff. Comments, questions? When will this be available? We do not have a release date for it yet. Okay. Yeah, but you, uh, if you're on Discord, um, I'll, I'll usually be probably like uh, singing about it. So <laughs> they currently do a rule that is less than four characters. Corey is asking Ben. Characters as in symbol, uh, like uh, special characters, or just pretty much anything. Mm -hmm. like, anything. Very possible. Yes. Is it possible now? I didn't think no. Okay. No. Right now, it's very, very, very specific. It looks for that exact phrase, like exact matching. Yeah. But we want to we want to give it more flexibility. Yep. The field we currently have is contains, and so it's doing an exact match, which is why we're adding the flexibility of this matches field. So that'd be a big value add. I mean, there'll be more false positives, but this will require conversations, obviously, with partners. Right. Typically, majority of processing rules when you assign a name have more than three characters right mm -hmm. so um but this would account for more than just i mean obviously we're fighting the commas the periods the mm -hmm. the dashes i mean we're fighting all of those right um yep. and so instead of having to making multiple wild cards having a general rule also of hey anything that's less than four characters or one two or three characters only should trigger a uh, a rule Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if this lets us uh, maybe like include or maybe exclude um, like the you know expected uh, domains. So yeah, this might help with uh, my attempt to uh, kind of exclude guest sign-ins from some of these rules. So might be able yeah, to do that. So you know, Ben has described this as an additional operator, uh, which right now we're calling matches, but. The the wild cards will still be of it will be available with contains and does not contain Stephen so you you would be able to um, you know have a okay so maybe you start using wild cards or R at foo.com. okay thanks and you got some yeah what's coming up for me when you begin to do the address this we're going to have a collection of uh, rules that will need to be re replicated or descriptions that need to be replicated across. Um, potentially multiple customers or unique, more unique to different customers. Could we have a table potentially with an index that allows us to reference these particular wildcard sent phrases that we could say, uh, we wouldn't have to go through and find it, but we could reference it. So the, the premise here is that I'd have one place for all my uh, description wildcards and, and uh, definitions and to be able to reference those from the actual respond rules themselves. Is that making any sense? Not really. Okay. So <laughs> yeah. if, if, I mean, if we, go ahead. you could create templates here, Andy, 
um, and then obviously apply those templates um, across all of your customers very easily. Um, and that brings up a good point that I'm surprised no one's asked yet, which is what's the impact going to be on existing rules? And the answer to that is it will have no impact on existing rules. Uh, this will be additive. I would imagine over time that this that uh, this operator um, and the the capability to use wildcards is going to allow our partners to trim down the number of rules that they have um, that are looking for, you know, exactly contains or does not contains um, because we haven't had the wildcard operators up to this point. So we would expect over time that that will it will actually drop down. We're going to put a lot of training behind this. Um, Anthony um, and Ben are going to be doing, you know, dedicated office hours for this. The support team is going to be trained up very specifically on this. We'll have a knowledge base article to accompany this um, because it is possible when you're using wildcards to run yourselves down a rabbit hole. Um, and one of our chief concerns, quite honestly, is that someone creates a respond rule that's going to, um, you know, send the, the backend resources into you know a crazy wildcard searching loop um and we're we're we believe and probably the reason we haven't released this yet is because when we have to make sure we test the crud out of it um that we can set up parameters that will prevent that from happening we already have a system in respond that looks at a respond rule that's created and it will warn you um you know if that respond rule is going to cause problems in the platform so we'll be extending that When, by the way, would this be an example of why Ben's new position starting September 1 would be really helpful? Because as you make these capabilities stronger, they're going to be incorporated automatically. Um, for people who are subscribing to MSA, I mean, that's kind of the primary purpose of MSA is for us to take responsibility to tune your environment and to optimize the environment. You know, we're not we're not a SOC. Um, you know, we're not an MSSP. We're perfecting our product so that partners don't have to put as much energy into uh, managing that. You know, we're, we're still not, you know, we're not managing customers. We're not reaching downstream right. from you guys. What we're doing is we're taking the MSP that maybe doesn't have, you know, the size to have a dedicated team to really, really learn the tool um, and making sure that they're getting the most out of the tool. All right. I just think that what you just described is a selling point for MSA. This um, whole process. I hope so. Yeah. Good stuff. Other questions for Ben or Amanda? Going once. Andrew, I have a quick note. Yeah, of course I do. So this morning we made Hoodoo generally available after one of our account managers told me it's basically ready to go. There's a lot of requests coming through for that. So you should all see Hoodoo inside um, when you are connecting an organization, it is now generally available. Very cool. Anybody using Hoodoo have questions for Leron or anybody that works on that in the dev team? Hearing a lot more about Hoodoo um, these days, interestingly. Um, all right, moving on. Let's go into, bear with me. Uh, the top of the jour. So, um, I am going to just put the clip of the week from the cyber call in chat. I thought it was really interesting. Gary, um, asked Matt Holland, the CEO of field effect about, uh, some vendor due diligence questions and Matt does a really good job expanding on, you know, getting away from yes or no questions um, and helping uh, MSPs ask better questions. So that is that. All right. So last week, um, I don't want to show that first. How do I show this? Oh, last week. <laughs> I might as well show it. Um uh, we, last week we asked about, you know, risk to reputation. How long can you be without your, you know, your, your applications and that I, I messed up. I, is it this one here? I should, yeah, here we go. <laughs> Ironically, this is the, uh, this was last, what started us off last week. Uh, if you recall, Chip, this was the 
slide from last week following CDK and how it impacted everybody. Well, lo and behold, we have, um, and we looked at, you know, different, you know, uh, the impact of, you know, lost revenue. And then obviously we have this week. Well, let's just take a look. First off, I didn't even calculate it yet because I don't think this is done. Chip and I, you and I were had about a half hour, 45 minute conversation, but um, I'm guessing, I don't know, probably 50 to a hundred billion in market cap was lost in just a few days um, from, from this incident. And, you know, we haven't even begun to see the ripple effect of, you know, what, if you're, as an example, Chip, you and I were talking, like if you're Delta Airlines as an example, right? I mean, they're, uh, I don't know if I put it in here, but maybe I did. Is it Delta? Yeah, here we go. Delta, you know, is still reeling from, this isn't, again, remember, this isn't a cyber, is not, right? This is not a cyber incident. Um, but Chip, you know, you are really good, I think, when it, you know, people don't know this about you, but you know, even looking at businesses, you know, because of all the business experience you have, but talk to us like what, when you talk about 200 basis points in a quarter, what, what are you talking here of, of earnings? Like that's, that's substantial. I mean, you know, Delta is going to wind up with, with negative earnings, obviously for the quarter and probably for the year as a result of this. Um, and the story is nowhere near complete. I read an article a few hours ago um, that I didn't, Think to pull in here, but Delta's going to be—they're upping the game in terms of their reimbursement for rebookings um, and hotel stays. They're going way beyond what the the you know the maximum limits are set by the federal government under the Passenger Bill of Rights uh, program, which is the right thing to do. But it's going to cost them you know a massive amount of money. Um, that that doesn't even factor in what the fine is going to be from the Department of Transportation, which is probably going to be in the neighborhood of somewhere between 100 and $150 million. And and the legal costs. I mean, these guys, you know, Delta CEO, you know you're going to see him before a congressional committee in no time here. Mm -hmm. um, and ironically, Andrew, I would expect that someone's going to ask the very question that we've been talking about now. This is the second week. Where was the risk analysis and the business continuity planning? Like, how could you guys not have considered that this could happen and have some kind of an alternate approach, a backup set of systems, or even if you had to go back to, you know, to manual processing and telephone calls from gate to gate, how could you not have thought of this as a possibility? Yeah. So. It, it's, it's, it. so, so again, right. This is really fascinating. The, um, as, as we look at this from a, you know, business impact, right. <clears throat> I want us to, you know, really think about this from the exercise of, of helping, our own MSP and our customers think through and get away from conversations around technical controls, right, Chip? Because this is this is really about, you know, when, when we bridge out here, what was impacted? Well, obviously the ticketing and reservation systems. Uh, the other systems that were massively impacted were the flight attendant and um, pilot you know, so now we're looking at HR systems. They, those people, the the resources within Delta, one of the big reasons for the flight cancellations was they couldn't figure out what flights, where, when, how, et cetera. Um, so this also really sh shines a huge light on something uh, Jerry Craig said from Intiva, which was always, you know, a lot of MSPs putting the cart before the horse when it comes to B BCDR plans. He's like, I don't know how you can do a business continuity plan without a business impact analysis, right? And and this highlighted the you know what out of that very statement, no? Absolutely. I mean, you know, this is all of Delta systems because they're using CrowdStrike widely. So this goes down to, a, you know, someone in the maintenance hangar has to turn around and go to their Windows machine running their maintenance software and and check the boxes that they've done the necessary inspections on an aircraft. I mean, every every part of the operation is impacted by by this particular takeout. You know, it doesn't mean that people can't do their jobs, but they can't document their jobs. Um, think about the number of pilots um, and air crews, you know, flight attendants that 
have daily call outs or six and they, you know, six situations or whatever else that comes up that goes on all day long in every airline where they have to reshuffle stuff. I'm sure there's people on this call who've been sitting on the tarmac and somebody says, Oh, you know, we've got to get a new crew because we had somebody calling sick and blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, the, the, the flight, the first officer on this flight, you know, had to get taken off because he isn't well. So now they're going to wait for 45 minutes for somebody else to show up so they can continue to flight. Like all of that stuff requires the the HR system, the documentation system, and they're they're paralyzed without it. Right, right, right. So this very much was, if you think about it, we, you you apply, um, you know, a, a type of cyber attack, right, Chip? This is, I'm air quoting here. This is a large scale DDoS attack. This is a mass ransomware attack. The the end result, right? was inability to do anything in this operation and therefore very you know li- clearly like you said when they go in front of congress it's there the question is going to be where was the contingency plan yeah right. um, there's and they, they're going to have some tough um explaining to do because you've got american united you have other carriers that were also impacted I just happened to be flying American last Friday, you know, right in the thick of this. Um, And they had a one hour ground delay across the entire system. Um, And after that, you know, by by the end of the day, Friday, they were back on schedule. Um, So not that I'm a huge fan of American over Delta. In fact, I kind of prefer flying Delta. I like the airplanes better and, you know, the amenities and all that stuff. So I'm not, not providing an endorsement, but there are definitely comparisons to airlines that did this better. And remember, this wasn't just airlines. This was banks. This was hospitals. This was businesses of all shapes and colors all over the globe. Eight million Windows endpoints, according to, um, uh, you know, one Microsoft statement that I read, you know, across the globe. That's a big number. You know, that's a lot of machines to get taken out all in one crack. Yeah, absolutely. But Andrew, with with all that said, one of the things I'm not really hearing anyone talk about, it was ended up being 1% or slightly less than 1% of all Microsoft devices affected worldwide. Right. What happens when Microsoft actually goes down? Mm. That's what everyone needs to be asking themselves. Well, what oh What is God. a contingency plan then? Because I don't think that's a matter of if. I believe that's a matter of when. Jim, the other question is like, Think like what would have happened? Just curious, right? The other the other conversation is, what if this was Linux for a moment, and all OSs that were the backbone of the internet, and a bunch of big SaaS applications and Amazon and big e-commerce and um, so so the fact that it was only Windows was a huge in essence, uh, a, a shade of a stroke of luck it also, right? In, in, in As big as this was, mm-hmm. it could have been horrifically worse. Yes. And eventually I, I it will I, be horrifically worse. Because I think again, that's, I don't, that's the point Jim's making. Yeah, right. it, it will be. And again, I don't think this is a question of if, it's when. My, Microsoft is at this point just too vulnerable for this not to happen at a bigger scale with them. And Jim, part of the issue is that their their operating system is so fragile that this actually happened. Now, CrowdStrike made the mistake, but Microsoft deserves some liability here as well. Did you? I should have put this in here, but did you guys see, and again, Corey, I know you have some comments coming up here and you're all going to chime in. I just thought the left. Did you see Microsoft's comment about why they couldn't do anything? And the result was because of the EU's ruling that they had to allow kernel level access um, uh, in the non-competitive uh, court case. Um, did you see that, by the way? I, hadn't, I didn't see it now, but I'll, 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 I'll see if I can find it. But um, Chip, did you see that? That that that's that was their that was Microsoft's defense on how could this happen at the kernel level? Well, the EU made us do it. Uh, 
Wow. That's, that's like the, the former head of the secret service saying that the roof was too sloped. I mean, I, I find that's kind of stunning. I mean, you, when you're writing a, a system level driver like this, and you, you know, with a language like C or C++, the whole purpose of, of developing it in that way is so you have kernel level access. I mean, I think, they, I think you need it for an, an anti-mail or EDR product to actually function correctly. So I hadn't seen that, Andrew. I mean, I don't recall the EU uh -huh. coming out and saying you have to allow kernel access. Like that's an EU regulation. I find it strange that they would. Uh, let me let me let me see if I can if I can if I can find it while others others are commenting. Corey, did you? I know you said you you had some thoughts on this. Do you, do you want to make a comment real quick? And yeah. I'll I mean, I'll try so and find that. I'm not surprised. So when this happened, I wasn't surprised. Unfortunately, we've been battling with a similar situation with uh, I'll say another vendor. Um, a lot of these, you know, AV slash EDR vendors are, have started diving into the kernel level. Most of the major ones are now. Not everybody is, but most of the major ones are now. And while there's some, for more advanced attacks, there's some benefit to it, in comes a lot of risk. Ever since one of our vendors started diving into the kernel level, it's been nothing but issues, right, with outages or conflicts and they're conflicting with the DAC file of Windows and or Microsoft and um, so I wasn't surprised when this happened right because again it's something that we've been battling for a while with other vendors having uh, Windows instability issues with the monitoring in the kernel level now what my frustration around this you know and shame on CrowdStrike for was it was a it was a ghost update right they pushed out an update that wasn't configurable or manageable by the partners right where you know that's that's kind of a no-go all all you know our general guidance to every single organization out there that we help support is never turn on auto update that's the stupidest thing you could do like i never push automatic updates to my servers i have maintenance windows i manually push updates to them i manually reboot them it's part of our go-to right because servers i mean we've all if you've ever been in the system side you've been bit with blue screens from windows updates similar situation so what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to have, you're supposed to test them, test right, these updates right. and these agent updates as they come. In reality, most MSPs don't have the overhead to do that. Right. Let's be honest. And that's, but at least it was configurable and managed by them. Corey, two, could I interrupt for a minute? Two, 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 two questions for you. Yep. One, one um, the, the question I have is, you know, in talking to people that do dev work, um, why a was rhetorically, I'm not saying you have, give me the answer, Corey, but rhetorically, my questions are, why wasn't it staged? Like I was talking to Ryan Weeks in his days at data and he'd be like, look, we would push to the first 1% of our, you know, X that tens of thousands of agents out there to see, right. What the response is. He's like, cause 1% of our customer base is going to pull our help desk to its knees, let alone 100% mess up. Um, and second, to your point of, of, of auto updates, it seems like this content push from CrowdStrike was almost like you didn't, quote unquote, have a say so because it was, it was like for, IO, their, for IOC detection and things of that nature. Um, so... That those are my two kind of like are those the right questions to be asking here or some of the right questions? Yes, and they again I'm still waiting on more details to come out. I think it's going to be a while till we get the full story, right? Of and but again we've had this issue, right? So even on our offerings we test all new agent updates internally, and then we have multiple of our beta partners testing it, and then of course there's one MSP some type of software that none of these other people are using. It just crashes all their machines. And right. I mean, but you should still have that due diligence. You should still follow that process. So I'm still waiting on additional and accurate information coming out of CrowdStrike to really, what, what's the, the true and real story of what really happens? Um, it's very eye-opening to see their outreach. And I knew they had a very large outreach, mainly in, in the enterprise space more than the MSP space. But... I mean, it brought, like you said, a lot of things to its knees. That Interesting, though, Chip. You can you talk about the stats you guys pulled real quick? What what was the percentage you found? 
Um, well, our last partner survey indicated that 25% of our partners use CrowdStrike um, as EDR. Um, the other 50, 51% were sent in the one and the rest fell into whatever category. So, you know, that's between the two of them, 75% is effectively of our partners are using one or the other, Ascent One and CrowdStrike. You know, I want to follow up on, on Corey's comment. CrowdStrike has released more information. There's a couple more good articles about it. Obviously, the, you know, Reddit and X were flooded with people who had done analysis of the core dumps. Um, you know, I looked at those. I talked to some very, very bright people um, that are former colleagues of mine that are still very active um, C and C++ coders. You know, we all agree that the mistake that was made here is is something that you learn in CS101, or at least in the 1990s when CS101 was literally C++, that you don't do this. Um, this wasn't a compiled component. This was a control script of the core product of the Falcon engine. So that explains why a compiler wouldn't have picked it up. It would, would not have been flagged as a compile error. Um, CrowdStrike in their own, you know, admission or, or recap of what's going on here says that they relied on um, automated um, script analysis products in order to catch this kind of stuff. And that failed. The The question I have goes back to, you know, to Corey's comments, which is, I, I don't understand how crowd, a company like CrowdStrike um, could become so dependent upon, you know, an automated um script analysis tool that they wouldn't take the step to test this even on, you know, on either on virtual machines uh, that they have a virtual lab set up or physical machines like that. They wouldn't test every one of these. I mean, I remember when I was still an MSP back in the Windows NT and, and two early Windows 2000 server days, Patch Tuesday rolled around, right? Everybody remember what Patch Tuesday was? Our policy as a company was we didn't, we didn't, plug anything in on patch Tuesday until a minimum of two weeks after patch Tuesday, because we wanted to see if the world was going to blow up first. That kind of changed when, when zero day ex exploits became a thing. And then we were forced to make sometimes a different kind of analysis, but, you know, we were a Sage vendor and a goldmine vendor. And um, we knew that Microsoft could release stuff that would break back to your point, Andrew, the primary business application of clients. So we had to wait, you know, we had to wait, for the Microsoft community to sort it out. Then we had to look at the Sage community and say, you know, what what Mass90 products or, or Sage products are getting busted because of this. So I'm just stunned. And and I give CrowdStrike credit, by the way, for basically admitting we had lousy QA processes. They weren't tight enough. We're going to tighten them up. We're going to do rolling rollouts from now on. We're never going to do this, you know, one button push on a Friday night. Um you know, well, an early Friday morning, Eastern time, you know, that's not going to happen. They, you know, they've learned, they're stating that they've learned the lessons and they, and they're stating that they've learned the right things um, for, for what it's worth, you know, they're, they're coming clean um, in what looks to me like to be an honest manner with, with some integrity. It, I'm laughing because isn't George Kurtz the one that had this happen at McAfee, Corey, the very similar thing. When he was CTO there, that's what my understanding is. So, um, but but Chip, to your point, wouldn't they? Wouldn't deployment number one be to your ten thousand employees? I mean, does CrowdStrike have only Wind uh, Mac OS and 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 Linux? I, you know, obviously I have no idea what they've got internally. But even if they were a hundred percent, you know, Mac OS and um, you the whole Unix Linux you know, tree of the operating system world, you would still think that they would have at least VMs set up somewhere in which they would push a deployment first to make sure nothing broke. And they would do that all the time. You, I have to think when they were a smaller business, you know, many, many years ago, that that was probably their method. And they, and they've, as they've grown, it, you know, it becomes too time consuming. There's better ways of doing it, more efficient to use an automated tool that, you know, that can catch this kind of error. Um, interestingly they're not blaming it as a as a like a manufacturing failure of the automated tool i don't know if the automated tool that they use is in-house very well could be you know you can imagine that it might be um but nevertheless with this something this important i would just i'm just kind of stunned that they didn't take the step to actually test it on a windows os in the wild at least a couple you know you would think every supported version of windows how long could it take it to do that 
I mean, Literally. for clarity, that's that's what I'm talking about. Yep. As far as more information, I've I've seen the information on what was the problem, right? What caused the problem? But I want more information from them on what their due diligence was before them. What's their right. internal process when a new agent comes out? I've seen rumors. Obviously, I've seen Reddit. Who knows? Reddit's a wild west. So yeah. you know, yeah. oh, it was pushed out at India first. There was no issues. I mean, I've seen so many assumptions, right? But I want to, in you know, if they really show face in front of Congress, I mean. As we've seen recently, Congress loves to really grind into into individuals and and try to get some type of truth out. Yeah, but I think everybody's figured out the Congress to just say, "Well, I, I don't recall. I'll have to get back to you on that." <laughs> uh, <laughs> with my team. We'll send you the information. Like I I've watched enough hearings in my life to know that it's not worth watching. I mean, that's what I said. Some type of truth. I mean, let's get something that we don't see. I, Corey, I don't think we're going to get much more than we have. I really don't. I mean, I, I don't think they're going to come back and say, hey, you know, this is how we used to do it. They might come out and say, here's what we have changed. I, I don't hear them saying, you know, we made a decision to move to this automation rather than to doing live testing on machines in, you know, 2019 because we felt it was better. I, I would really be stunned if we got to that level of transparency. Yeah. I mean, so, maybe... Uh... You know, as as I've told a lot of partners that have asked me about this, right? I don't. I'm not telling anybody to move away from CrowdStrike. I still think CrowdStrike's a great product. I think they got punched in the mouth on this one, justifiably so. Um, I think this will bring additional changes to them. A lot of vendors have really been punched in the mouth with doing stupid mistakes like this. Um, you know, for me, it's a matter of do they own it and do they learn from it and do they take it? Obviously, they're you know this is they're going to be forced to take additional measures to make sure something like this doesn't come out anymore you know i don't know how many people on this call have worked with crowdstrike before I, I had the quote unquote pleasure of working with them at the you know when the dnc got compromised they actually called solutions granted to come in and help crowdstrike assist them so there was i had a lot of banter and fun conversations i mean there's a lot of arrogance in crowdstrike so Maybe this will bring them back down to earth and they'll start making better, you know, changes, especially for their customer base. Well, my theory has been, I think I've expressed it before on this call, that the safest airline to fly is the one that had a crash last week because they're going to be paying the most attention. So I, I concur with your statement. I wouldn't be telling people to switch from CrowdStrike. I hope the whole industry learns the lesson from this. I mean, you know, the... The rest of the EDR vendors, by the way, those that are public are also getting beat up in the public markets. The whole NASDAQ has taken a hit from this. The The monetary damages are, are massive. I would expect there's going to be lawsuits. Um, you, know, you know, that's the kicker. It's just as you we started the conversation, Andrew, with you, you know, who is holding the bag for the damages here? Um, and how many MSPs that were using CrowdStack recommended it to their customers um, are trying to figure out how the hell am I going to pay my guys overtime uh, for the amount of work that has to go into remediating this, or that had went in before CrowdStrike had a a series of um, fairly automated remediations, but even some of those are difficult. Um, and the link that I posted, you know, from CrowdStrike in there actually for those who are interested, details all the different issues that are out there, including the BitLocker issues and everything else. So if if you're interested, it's worth the read. Yeah, a few things, you, you know, you as you and Corey have chatted, I just wanted to mention, Chip, number one, that's uh, the point of uh, the Cyber Call Monday with Reed um, and Eric Tilds. We're going to get into, you know, this is not anything to do with a cyber policy. If you're an MSP that spent, you know, a ton of time in remediation and a ton of lost time, this is tech e &O, And, you know, a check isn't just going to show up in the mail. Uh, Jim, are you surprised that, you know, you wouldn't just get a check in the mail? from CrowdStrike or their insurance company. Shocked. Uh, huh? I was, I'm shocked. I, I was looking in the mailbox today for it, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. So so there is definitely going to be a process to, if you're running CrowdStrike and you did a bunch of work uh, and you have lost revenue as associated with it, and so do your customers, by the way, um, there's a whole um, ripple effect of that. Um, the other thing that I did want to ask you, Corey, um, in talking to the folks at Black Hills, um, I agree with you and Chip that, hey, you don't just switch vendors. But from an attacker's standpoint, what they were saying is this certainly gives the Black Hat community an advantage um, right now, you know, knowing, you know, X, let's just say they know now of a thousand companies that are running CrowdStrike that gives them a big advantage 
uh, from a an attack perspective. So that that's that's the one thing I'm not again. Yeah, let's not just go throw the baby out with the bathwater. But from the red teaming, you know, pen testing side, the guys that can do it just as effectively as the as the threat actors like a BHIS, they're like, this is this is a gift to the to the threat actor community. That's how I feel about email gateways. I can easily go on an MX toolbox and look up your domain and see what email security platform you're using. It gives me a, an advantage. This does the exact same thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Chip, any thoughts on that? Just before we move on that piece of it, you know, do, you know, do you, do, you know, if you're sitting on a, on a board and you've got to make a decision now, um, I'm not again saying you know you rip and replace, but is that a consideration? A governance sure. consideration and risk. Yeah, of course it is. Um, you know, it, you have to weigh with the consideration of what's the cost to switch. You yeah. know, CrowdStrike is mostly an enterprise tool. If you're a Fortune 1000 or 500 company, you know, Fortune 500 company with 20,000 employees, a Fortune 500 company with or 1000 company with 8,000 employees, the cost of of making a change here is pretty astronomical and you know it we all we all all of us every day deal, deal with vendor lock-in for our own stuff that we consume and that we sell to our customers and that's always a big consideration um you hope that crowdstrike with its size and its resources um its connection to the government um you know as a as a government's a big customer of crowdstrike is going to have the financial means to weather this and weather it well and come out of it a stronger company. The bigger hope for me is that the whole industry is really paying attention, that Sentinel One and Huntress and Data EDR and everybody else, you know, they should be examining their own processes in the in the, the wake of this. One final chuckle I got is I was reading different CrowdStrike stuff today. I saw an article from yesterday that um a hacking group called USDOD claims that they're they're releasing all of CrowdStrike's um IOC data um that they that they have stolen from somewhere. The article seemed to point to they stole it from CrowdStrike customers that they compromised, but I thought it was an interesting side note, particularly with your comment about the threat actors having, you know, an advantage now or potential advantage now, um, seeing a vulnerability and a weakness. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, Corey Snurkey, you must have read that same article. No, it's, it, it, well, what I, what I smirk about is a default IOC database should not be relied on. I'll, I'll just, when we look at different offerings, right? When we look at different solutions, IOCs are different across the board, depending upon the vendor, right? The flavor of the day that you're using, um, there needs to be a lot of, and you need to align with someone or align with threat intelligence where you're say consistently creating new IOCs, adding them to whatever platform you're currently using. If anybody is just using the default out of the box IOCs, I call it the vanilla version of that product, you are failing yourself. Yeah, I agree. Because a yeah. lot of these vendors for MSPs benefits, what they do is they reduce the amount of noise, right? Intentionally. So it's an easier product for you to manage, less overhead, which would be less costful to you. But what they're doing is they're reducing that amount of noise is reducing the amount of IOCs that are visible to you. That could be an advantage to you knowing that there's a more advanced attack that's hitting you and not just someone downloading Mimi Cats and getting quarantined, right? more advanced attacks, you're going to need customized, you're going to need the noise and you're going to need the capability of you or someone monitoring that noise that needs that noise. So that's why I was smirking because again, if you're just using the out of, out of the box vanilla version of it, I think that's could be an advantage of Falcon. I think Falcon adds additional IOCs, but yes, the default out of the box version of CrowdStrike. Yeah. Yeah. Hey everybody, Andrew, I gotta get going. I got a two o'clock here. Yeah, well, we're right at the top of the hour, Jim. Okay. So we'll see everybody next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a great one. Have a good one. Thanks, all.